Morning all. I thought we could have a look at another classic Fisher game, this time against Victor Korshnoy, who was one of the greatest uncrowned kings of the game, never to become world champion. So challenging strongly against Anatoly Karpov. Um, so, uh, okay, Fisher playing white in the Stockholm Interzonal, where Fisher had an amazing performance overall, 17.5 out of 22. So he was two and a half points clear of his nearest rivals, Geller and Petrosian. Uh, it's the first time an, an, a non-Soviet player had actually won an interzonal. Uh, so e4 from Fischer. Cautionary replied with e5. And we have a Roy Lopez. So a6, bishop e4. Knight f6. White castles. Very standard Roy Lopez here. b5. Now, uh, most common is d6 here. Also common is castle, so d6 over 17,000 games, but castle is about 9,000. c3, d6, so very theoretical here. This early d4, also more popular in this particular position, is actually h3 with over 16,000 games. d4 has over 2,000 games, so it seems to allow this annoying pin, uh, which is used by Victor Cautionary. An interesting finesse about this position so is it so bad to allow the pin maybe maybe many of us been thinking this is like mandatory to play h3 um then you know the game could continue like this build up like this so it's interesting um how it changes the nature of the position to allow this pin with bishop g4 so we have bishop g4 played by vector cautionary and now here uh, this might look a bit odd, and it's actually quite a lot of uh, tactical content behind it. But um, White's usual move is actually Bishop E3 as Fisher played it. Uh, D5 is also uh, quite common, but um, Black seems to be equalising, you know, quite comfortably here in this sort of position. That pin is quite handy, really. Uh, the Bishop can actually retreat to C8 as well. So this kind of position, Black's achieved the aim of getting the position more closed. Can try and use that C file later, maybe. Okay, so um, in the game we see this move, Bishop E3, and it's more tactical in content. You'll see this E4 pawn can be taken. Um, if it is taken, I mean it's it's rarely taken. Why it's meant to have a slight advantage, only a slight advantage. Uh, you might think, well, isn't Black losing a piece? This is interesting to consider, Bishop D5. Here, queen d7, and it's not so clear cut. Black is losing a piece because bishop takes. We have d5, and then this pin is actually made use of here. But in this variation, this is okay for white. Um, white can play knight d2, for example, and have a small advantage here. This position is okay for white. Uh, if we have a look at this. Here, this is okay for white. There's still uh, some play left in the position. So bishop e3 is an interesting move, offering that e4 pawn. And we see after e takes, c takes. Um, white is now threatening. Well, let me put this on the board. After knight takes e4, this is this is very different. Here, uh, <laughs> bishop bishop d5 is good. Uh, stronger than before, but also there's queen c2 hitting both knights. Uh, so black would be kind of losing a piece for not much. Bishop takes f3, uh, queen takes here is strongest. So there's a bit of a tactical line, uh, you know, that e4 pawn being vulnerable or seemingly vulnerable. So anyway, uh, after c takes d4, Victor Cautionary plays knight a5. White wants to preserve his bishop here. He plays bishop c2 and now protecting that pawn officially. Knight c4 attacking this one as well as the dark square bishop. So Fisher retreats his dark square bishop. So it might seem a bit odd the whole thing allowing the pin which you might have thought was mandatory to play h3. Bishops retreating like this. But uh, white is looking forward to kicking this knight and potentially using this diagonal perhaps with bishop b2 later. Uh, that's that's one idea. Uh, C5 was played, and now B3 kicking the knight. 
and in this position it's a positional concession is needed it seems does white really want to play d5 here because it gives up that e5 square it would seem and worse black has a standard sort of maneuver there like fd7 the bishop f6 if white doesn't play d5 then say, say this it just doesn't seem as though there's much going on here for white um, the tension of the position seems a lot less uh, black also can put pressure directly on the d-file with rook fd8 or rook a d8 later. So fish actually closes up things with d5, allowing this seemingly large positional concession. But this is his positional judgment and, and knowledge of opening theory. Move 15, d5, it's okay, it seems. Knight d7, knight, and then he plays just calmly knight bd2 to address this upcoming bishop f6. So now he can just put the rook on b1. Okay, now here, a positional concession from black this time. Although it appears black has the three to two pawn majority, to play c4 is compromising that d4 square. The d4 square, if a knight can maneuver like this, forget about the pin for a moment, to f5, then that's dangerous, all this diagonal. But the use of the d4 square could be strategically useful for white. So playing c4 is quite committal. Uh, the engine suggestion is actually bishop h5 here, uh, for example like this, and this should be um, reasonable for white. This kind of position, white can play knight g3 and still maybe play for knight f5 later. Uh, but uh, that's another reasonable way of playing it, just bishop going crawling back, zigzagging back to put pressure on e4. But uh, yeah, this move c4 was played, uh, and now Fischer kicks that bishop and cautionary actually doesn't go to h5 interesting he gives up the light square bishop voluntarily probably to put more pressure on the dark squares immediately bishop h5 does run into g4 potentially which is potentially useful for white and this position as, as we've just seen uh, is interesting uh, but uh, yeah cautionary took on f3 immediately giving up the light square bishop Knight takes f3, and the knight seems to be wanting that d4 square really uh, soon. C takes b3, as though there's going to be some embarrassment on the c file. Uh, A takes b3, queen c7. Uh, so white needs to be careful about rook coming to c8 soon to put pressure on that c file. Also, there's a knight rerouting maneuver uh, in theory to, to c5 to maybe put pressure on e4 later. Bishop e3 <coughs> is played here. Bishop c3, now rook e2. And this is not just uh, reacting to threat, it also might be useful for putting pressure on the c file later. Once this bishop moves, there's rook c2 as a resource. b4, so Korshnoy is a little bit overextended with his concept of c4 and then b4. He's weakened a few key squares here, notably that d4 square. And it's here Fisher uses the d4 square with knight d4. It would seem unwise to give up the dark square bishop here. Let's have a quick look. Cautionary played rook fe8, but if he played bishop takes d4, in this position queen takes d4 actually, is also, as well as bishop takes d4, this is interesting. Uh, so black has to react to that pawn for a moment. This position looks fairly nice for white. White might even consider queen d3. This type of thing. Here, white is doing quite nicely with the bishop pair against the knights. So there's significant pressure here. And in fact, rook a4 could be on the card. So that b4 is actually vulnerable with the knight stumbling around here. So this is given as a clear advantage from an engine perspective. This, this sort of position here is a clear advantage. So it's, it seems unwise to give up the bishop in principle, but otherwise, you know, the knight coming to f5 looks a bit dangerous. Rook f8, and the knight does come to f5. Now the knight reroutes here, knight b7. We see bishop d4. So threatening now, knight takes g7. Black reacts to that with g6. Fisher now plays knight h6, check, king f8. And now here, 
rook c1. So trying to use this pin on the queen. Bishop seems a bit awkwardly placed there. Rook a c8. And then we see bishop d3 officially creating that pin on the on the bishop against the queen. Queen a5. And this allows Fisher to basically seemingly win a pawn by force now by putting pressure on that pin's piece with rook e c2. So has this gone badly wrong for black? Interesting position. So bishop takes d4, we can now just take on c8 instead of um, so pinning to the rook now. Knight e5 was played. Bishop retreats here. So keeping the pressure on a6, for example, this could be handy in the future. That pressure on a6. White is now uh, in a commanding position, a small advantage, knight c5. Offering a pawn here, pawn sacrifice, but what else? From an engine point of view, this is the best move actually. Uh, to put pressure on that b3 pawn and the center. It's these two pawns are the pressure points, it seems, for black. So knight c5 addresses them. Uh, if we play something else, king, king g7, the knight can come back here, it's no problem. Change the e5 knight. Uh, this position is, is comfortable for white. So caution is knight c5 is interesting. So offering a pawn. But with a lot of pressure, it seems. So I pawn down here officially. Um, now, king g7, knight g4 here. Now, of course, he just takes on g4. But we see now that it's not so easy after knight takes g4 to actually win this pawn in this position. The queen is eyeing c8. So that rules out rook takes e4. We just take on c8. And knight takes e4, we just take on c8 with the rook. So e4 can't be taken. And you might think, well, b3 is also pinned to the rook. Knight takes b3, we just we just play rook takes. So neither pawn uh, can be taken at the moment. We see, though, the move rook b8, engine's top choice. So this is caution noise conception. b3 and e4 are victimized here. So although a pawn down, and potentially this knight might be actually useful against the bishop. So temporarily a pawn down, but is black getting the pawn back? So this is the big suspense of this position. White could easily falter in this position um, and have a bad position. Uh, say say he wanted to defend e4 with f3. Then rook takes b3 and black's more than equal here after takes. This position is actually very pleasant, for example. Queen c2 and black looks forward uh, to a very nice game here, like with an outside pass pawn as, as well. This is potentially very dangerous. So, so Fisher needs an accurate move in this position. He's temporarily a pawn up. And he plays actually rook f3. This is a very interesting move now. So queen f4 is introduced, hitting d6 and f7. So a quick shift to black's king safety. Uh, while black gets his pawn back. Black has a choice now to take on e4 or b3. Um, well, actually, is b3, is that palatable? Knight takes b3, no. Knight takes b3 is terrible, actually. White wouldn't move the rook. Queen d7 um, on f7. So here, rook c7, end of game, really. f7 is big trouble. So yeah, black has to be very careful after this rook f3. That f7 issues don't go out of out of control. We see now black playing knight takes e4. Another idea would have been rook rook b7, just keeping things as a status quo, where black might consider then knight takes e4 without this infiltration. Um, this should be about equal apparently. This position here. So rook b7 is interesting prophylaxis. And just keeping a pawn down for a bit, bit longer. But yeah, knight takes e4, gets the pawn back in a hurry. But there's a downside. Yeah, queen f4 is a slight downside. So hitting f7. Uh, now again, rook b7 would seem useful prophylaxis against rook c7. And it seems about equal from an engine perspective. Maybe caution is getting into time trouble. It's approaching move 40. He actually played a more weakening sort of move, f5. Um, yes, you see only the queen holding c7. When I 
talked about rook b7 it's it's just in principle to free the queen as well actually sorry the queen's obviously on c7 uh in some of the variations that was that was very dangerous but here this this is slightly weakening for black's king side without the f pawn h7 could get greater exposure if white did get a rook on the 7th and we'll see that in some of the variations coming up it's slightly weakening to play f5 uh, we see rook e3 here and now also f5 is a target to g4 this knight's a little bit loose although it looks quite impressive it's also itself a target on e4 for g4 uh, to undermine its security uh, so we see uh, cautiously a little bit under pressure here after this rook e3 he needs to play an accurate move and again this is actually a dual purpose move to, to maybe switch to the center if rook b7 was played here uh, we see in this position also the d5 pawn uh, would be be useful that's another thing uh, it could actually be taken soon because the queen doesn't have to guard c7 with that move uh, this position here uh, is interesting uh, but still might be quite nice for white it's, it gets a bit complex here g takes this might actually be okay if white takes on a6 but uh, yeah rook b7 uh, crops up as, as like an engine first choice nearly in, in many of these positions to play rook b7 what was played was rook e5 uh, which looks good as well from certain perspectives it covers up that d6 pawn so any f3 now um, d6 isn't a problem if f3 is played actually here then there's even worse than uh, than the knight retreating can you see what black could play here uh, if I gave you five seconds to pause the video here what would you play with black on f3 here okay g5 yes that's horrible actually if the queen retreats then queen b6 is embarrassing yeah so this has to be played very cautiously this position it can go actually into a disaster mode with now f4 on the cards as rook e3 yeah <laughs> ouch so white has to be very careful here after this rook e5 fisher plays a very good move rook c6 so it covers up that b6 square so this diagonal making f3 more realistic to play at some point uh, soon it's also looking at a6 and d6 like that so keeping a lot of pressure on black now we see the move rook b e8 this might be a slight mistake uh, apparently rook takes d5 is interesting so here this position trying to undermine the knight rook d1 takes queen a1 it, get, it gets a bit hairy but this this kind of variation uh, should also be okay for white but maybe not a huge deal very very scary for both sides uh, basically uh, yeah these these checks look scary but maybe the king could come out like this and that would be okay so they're not that scary so it might be a little bit in um, white's favor though it's, it's tiny bit in white's favor here from an engine perspective so very complex positions here but uh, this is the key moment you see after rook c6 where the evaluation went downhill for victor cautionary after this move uh, so yeah rook takes d5 needs to be considered a g5 here by the way there's queen f3 that's okay and then rook takes d6 um is interesting because of this pin on the knight knight takes rook takes e5 uh, so but we see yeah this rook b e8 now with rook takes d6 now move 39 well it has now rook d7 check to get onto that seven rank and pressurize h7 potentially so it's dangerous knight takes we have the pin now rook takes e5 and there's nothing for black there just lost the exchange so caution is in trouble just one move before the time control he plays queen a1 and he's dropping now another pawn he's two pawns down now rook takes a6 okay so rook a7 seems dangerous caution reacts to that with queen d4 to stop at least rook a7 but he's two pawns down 
Is he going to get this pawn? Well, that queen is kicked again. Uh, so he's not easily getting any pawn back. And now white has a huge pass pawn and he uses that d6. So how Courtenoy has been smashed in just a few inaccurate moves here. This is like plus five now. It's it's virtually over. Uh, for it's it looks like a crushed position. Uh, g5 was played. Now queen e3, which facilitates uh, lots of things like queen a7 now or queen d4. F4. Um, here, yeah, this is a very strong position for white. I think queen d4 wouldn't be too bad, but even stronger was queen a7 check that was played, and cautionary resigned here. If let's have a look at this final position then. If king f8, d7, rook d8. Here, queen c7. This d pawn is actually winning the game here in this variation. So hitting e5. Well, the queen's protecting e5, but d8. How does black address d8? He has to, the engine stretch is giving up the rook here. That's, that's how bad it is. So the pass pawn just emerges as a winning pawn here. Uh, so behind the scenes, the f3 threat never needed to actually be played. Uh, it's just that d pawn was winning here. You, it was useful at this point to stop any rook e7. So that was a fantastic tempo gain for the d7 move. Uh, if king g8, d7, rook e8, doesn't make much difference. This position here doesn't make uh, much difference at all. Yeah, uh, so a series of weakening moves. It just seems if we just rewind back uh, around about here after the first pawn sack. So cautionary had pressure here. Yes, he needed to play very accurately after rook f3. But even this move is not, from an engine point of view, queen f4 is interesting here actually. Just eyeing d6 immediately. If takes rook c7, uh, this is dangerous. Th this this variation uh, is, is dangerous for black as well. So maybe best play from both sides, white, white was a little bit better. But here, you know, it's not like the game. There isn't as much tension as the game. The way the way the game progressed seems to be a huge amount of tension with White retaining that D pawn. If we look at this, the way Fisher's played it. So instead of playing that Queen F4, I mean, maybe he considered it here. But by playing Rook F3, yeah, he's keeping a lot more tension in the game. Uh, so yeah, apparently Rook B7 would be useful here. Um, it's it just it's a very complicated uh, position, but uh, so why was it a disaster again? Just to review that knight takes e4. I think the first really loosening move for black comes up here, where again in this position either rook b7 or rook e7 to defend off f7. I mean it seems in a way a bit artificial that pieces in front of pawns without using any pawn breakthrough white, but it requires accurate defense, not not a loosening move from black, because otherwise this this kind of artificial looking stuff um, is, is absolutely justified I think with f5. It, it just seems intuitively loosening as though it's asking for trouble in inverted commas. Uh, but concretely how it remains, it, it's actually implied behind the scenes. When, when white plays rook e3, this idea of g4 is behind the scenes. Uh, or f3 potentially, um, not necessarily in this position because there's g5 and queen b6. Uh, yeah, if if rook b7, it it's uh, g g4 is actually the more significant move here, which which exposes the knight. Uh, and f3 here, I think, might not be that wise. Again, g5. Is interesting with with the idea of just exploiting this pinned rook. So like this, okay. So behind the scenes, it's it maybe more of a case that g4 here to undermine the knight. Uh, this is an interesting position indeed, uh, favoring black. I think if white has to give up the queen, yeah. So the move g4, I think, is the more significant thing to be worried about. Where white would still, uh, it seems, secure an advantage. G5, I think, we can just. Uh, well, taking on on f5, there's rook f f7 now. Actually, in this position, queen f3 though, and that that does look like a new, a loose knight. So again, it's it's just exposing the fact there's some weaknesses here. But the knight on e4 
is itself a little bit of, of liability tactically. This kind of scenario is okay for Huawei. So it seems, yes, this dismantling which started here, Rook C6 was a very, very good move. Though it's like a forking two key pawns with the Rook basically. Um, where Rook takes D6 was immediately threatened. So it did require a very accurate move here. And this, this wasn't it, Rook B E8. So from this Rook B E8, White basically, that was the birth of that very dangerous D pawn, which won the game. Um, if if we had taken here, this is another sorrow. The Queen was trying to cover C7. So taking that D pawn would lead to Rook C7 check. The Queen always wanted to hold C7 in a lot of positions. And this is like disastrous here, Queen H4. So here, Queen's overloaded, Bishop C4. We can get the Queen off there. D5 we just take here. So that's the disaster on h7. So that's like a symptom of playing this f5 that the h7 pawn was loose. So I really wanted that that seventh rank infiltration, especially as soon as f5 had occurred. But the sixth rank infiltration, not bad either for the d pawn from the d pawn perspective uh, to win d6 here. Once d6 had been won, now this is really quickly downhill after queen a1, uh, losing that second pawn, being two pawns down. Uh, best move here, technically g5, check, king g6. This is black's best apparently. One idea for black here, which makes use of the doubled rooks and potential vulnerability of vulnerability of f2 in this diagonal, which is very interesting to consider, but dismissed by engines, is actually queen b6. Queen b6 um, has a horrible threat of knight takes f2. As, as a basic example here of how the rooks can coordinate, the queen can coordinate here, say h4 is a silly move. Knight takes f2 uh, is really quite good. Knight h3 check, for example like this, check, check, <laughs> like this. Uh, so yeah, this idea basically um, is knight takes f2 here. Um, if we played, um, let's say, bishop d3, there's a more plausible move to h4, knight takes f2. Again, we see uh, some other ramifications. Knight takes d3 check. Um, we can take here and um, take here just to piece up. So knight takes f2 would have to be addressed, but from an engine point of view, this this is actually seen as better for white with either rook d3 or rook e2. Uh, rook d3 is is quite strongly addressing it. I'm not sure if if knight f6. Okay, the rook can um, in this position after knight f6. Rook c3, remarkably. If knight takes rook c6 check, so white could even be uh, better with this move. Yes, it's pretty cunning stuff. Rook c3 for rook c6. The rook doesn't have to move, so rook c3 is like the only move, but a good move. And then uh, say rook e1. Then not taking the knight to lose the queen. Rook here. This is better for white. Uh, queen b5. Rook here. This position uh, is still better for white slightly, but even stronger than that. So after Queen B6, from an engine point of view, Rook E2 is just laughing at this Queen B6 concept uh, for various reasons. What does Black actually try and do here? Uh, say Queen. Uh, so say knight c5. Again, uh, there's the concept of using the c6 square, and th you know these resources for using the c6 square. I don't think um, previous annotators really saw as easily. It's just because of the modern engine uh, era. We can we can say that now. Rook c2 here is is just embarrassing. Black 
because of the Rook C6 resource. I know it's it's ridiculous, but um, uh, previously, you know, in, in annotators of this game, there's been an indication that cautionary could have vastly improved uh, in this position uh, here by um, this. This was seen like the major blunder of this game by by various annotators, but the vast improvement was meant to be with uh, this g5, this position here, by playing queen b6. It just doesn't seem to. Uh, very, work very well. Although there's a loose rook, which seems to be asking uh, for trouble, uh, the c6 square is actually of great significance here, <laughs> technically. So rook e2 here, yeah. If I'm trying to harass the rook, there's there's rook c2. Uh, so say yeah, we've just we've indicated knight c5. There's rook c2. So knight f6. Uh, also in this position, um, the idea is not to take here. This this is better for black because the rook's kind of stranded, totally stranded. Uh, it's got no, nowhere to go. Uh, so, but the idea again in this position is rook c2. So using that c6 square. So that d pawn is very very handy. The squares it controls either c6 in this position or e7 later. Yeah. So that's just an interesting uh, technical point. Actually, I really wanted to add about this position and what happened here. Uh, pre disaster move queen a1 so it seems you know black's forcing moves need to be explored here um so uh yeah the forcing move g5 needs to be explored and if black has any ideas of of creating threats it's very interesting to analyze queen b6 but technically um the engine suggests queen a1 which will be the analysis uh, you'll see now on brief analysis, this position here, uh, Black's king looks a bit odd there. A6 looks vulnerable still, but apparently uh, this this is a lesser evil choice. Black might um, let's see. Rook takes e3. This this is a complicated uh, position. Say so, say so like this. White White has to play um, accurately. With rook takes a6 check there, white might still be um, doing okay here, but it's more likely to be a draw. Uh, there might be a more accurate way of playing that, though after queen a1. Um, rook takes e4 is interesting. Uh, we tried rook a7 there. There's, a, there's, there's, there's another way of playing it with queen e2. It's a bit hairy, but just cautionary just seemed to collapse. Uh, completely in the game continuation. So rook takes a6, rook d3, just two pawns down with white having a d pawn. Uh, black really had taken all the risks with his pawns. I know there's a tendency sometimes of a vector caution to push a bit too many pawns, but yeah, the d pawn is, is pretty strong here. And that's a very, very useful move uh, for queen a7 for d7 soon. Okay, so here uh, black resigned coming up here. Okay, I hope you got something from that game. Um, yeah, he's keeping an eye on f2 as well, by the way. So this position, yeah, an eye is kept on f2. And one thing not examined was queen takes f2 here. The rook holds g3, so king h2 here, it's no problem. Uh, white's winning this position as well. Sorry, I didn't miss that one <laughs> before. So, yes, complicated positions there towards the end in, in Victor Cautionary's time trouble, really, approaching move 40. And um, yeah, he ends up losing two pawns, and the d pawn was winning the game in the end. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.